chapter that we were just got started on. Didn't get very much in it at all. Uh, we'll look at nice switches. Nice switches now are, uh, we won't see many nice switches on them because they're kind of dangerous. Uh, we'll see them used as just a lot. And you know, that will be sealed inside some type of panel bar. And this is a uh, diagram of the panel box. You'll see these all over the place. And usually when you see this pull handle on the side, uh, then that's going to be a knife switch. And I think I passed the knife switch around, right? So y'all can look at it. It's got the blades on it. And, you know. but most of them now are spring-loaded. We got basically three, three categories of relays. And what are the three categories that we use in motor control? Anybody remember? Uh, we have what we refer to, we're going to refer to as a control relay, and then we're going to have something called a contactor, and then we're going to have something called a magnetic motor starter. And now, what's the difference of these three categories of relays? So what's the control? What is the control relay? A control relays contacts. Y'all y'all understand contacts now on a relay, right? Everybody okay there? They're magnetically controlled. The contact and normally a, 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 when you get out in the field, normally your uh say field. When we was in the Navy, we, we was going through schools, and it was always when you get into the fleet. So here we say when you get into the field. Uh, you know, we can't make everything exactly like it's going to be out there, but we try to do the best we can. So normally when you get into a, a, a control circuit, we're going to have two sections of the control circuit. We're going to have the control section. And then we're going to have the power section, right? Now the control section is going to be a relatively low, low, low voltage circuit compared to other voltages, right? You understand? <laughs> the power circuit is usually going to be a high voltage circuit. So what advantage does high voltage have over low voltage? What's that? Less current to run a load. Y'all understand loads are rated at, at a power rating, right? You understand? Power rating. So it's like this motor over here that y'all going to deal with. It's called a two voltage motor. So we can wire we can wire the motor for for two twenty, or we can wire, wire it for four forty. But it's still going to be a certain horsepower motor, right? Horsepower, by the way, is about seven hundred forty six watts per horsepower. And why is that important, though? Well, over here in the United States, using what we call the Imperial Standard of Measurement, we use horsepower. The rest of the world uses what we use watts. So a lot of times now when you look at a nameplate of a motor, it's going to say like 10 horsepower, 1.5 kilowatts. And of course, the kilowatts makes more sense because that tells me approximately how much wattage that motor is going to need to do what to run, right? You understand? Four horsepower. So I've had a ten horsepower, then that would be that would be seven point five kilowatts, right? For a ten horsepower. Motor. Right, that makes sense. So unfortunately, over here we're still using this, which makes no sense. Oh, I don't know how they came up with horsepower. What they was trying to do is uh, they, and I, I'd have to look it up, but what they was trying to do is. When, when the steam engine first came out, you know, it was a rotary engine. Everybody knew horses. They knew how much horses, you know, they, they knew if I was going to pull this, this certain load, they would have to have so many horses. So they understood horses. They had no idea of, about the work this steam engine would do. So what they got is they got, they got a big steam engine. They got a bunch of horses and they, and they put a big weight down in a well. 
And then they had a bunch of horses pull that thing up and they calculated the amount of time it would take these horses to pull that thing up. Then they went, then they hooked up the steam engine to it and they related to that. And then they said, well, this steam engine does the same work as seven horsepower, seven horses, and the same average work. And that's the way the term horsepower came up with. So horsepower is still rated to horses, right? How much work a horse could do. Uh, and that's moving, I don't know if I got 700, 500 and something pounds a certain distance in a certain amount of time. Uh, so it all rates with it with time. So if we're trying to run these big motors that require 7,000 watts of power, uh, if I run that, if I, and of course I, uh, if, if we design, if that motor was designed to run on 100 volts, then that's going to be 7,000 watts divided by 100 volts. That's going to be what? 70 amps of current, right? You understand that. Now, if I take that same uh, motor uh, and it runs on 7,000 watts and I run it on 1,000 volts and that's only 7 amps of current. You don't pay. What what bill do we pay every month? If y'all pay that bill. We don't pay a voltage bill. We don't pay a current bill. We pay a watt. Power bill because power is work. That's how much work you're paying the power company to do. Right? You understand that. Now we get it at all different types of voltages. When they're trying to send a ton of power, they send it at an extremely high voltage. And of course, the closer we get down the ground, we're going to have to lower that voltage down, right? You understand? So in your house, we have two voltages. What's the two standard voltages according to NEC, nominal voltages we run in our house? Yeah, 120 and 240. All your high wattage devices, your electric stoves, your dryers, your your air, air conditioning system, what do they run on? 240. Because they require less current, which means they can use smaller gauge wire and smaller relay contacts to control that current, right? You understand? Uh, all your low wattage devices are running on this guy, right? You understand? So the power section is usually going to be a high voltage uh, device so I can deliver a, a lot of power at a lower current. Now of course, so the motor circuit, a, 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 a real motor would be hooked up in the power circuit, right? So eventually we're going to stay, we're going to hook that, hook that motor up over there. And that's the, when finally we're going to get over to a power circuit. So, Control relays, their contacts stay inside the watt, the control section. So it means these are going to be little small relays, right? You understand? They're not going to have big contacts on them because they're controlling a lot less power, right? You understand that? Then I get over to the power section. These relays are going to be a lot bigger. Why? Because the contacts have to be a lot bigger because they're controlling a lot more power, right? You understand? But they're going to be doing it at a higher voltage. So when we talk about control relays, which is we're going to start out using, all your control relay contacts are going to be up here. Your power, your, your power section, these contacts are going to be over here. The relays will be over there, but their contacts will be over here. Y'all understand that? Yes, sir. So contactors, the main contacts on contactors go over here. Now it might have some already, it might have some auxiliary contacts over here, but these are going to be little old tiny contacts, right? I passed that relay around to you how many times now? Two or three with the with the little auxiliary contacts on the side, big power contacts on the top. Uh, then I showed y'all this one. The auxiliary contacts on this one uh, are on the top, and the power contacts are on the bottom. This is the. Uh, the one that we're going to use is this guy right here. I don't know if I fired up my. So uh, what we're saying is that if I've got a motor, a single voltage motor, is a high probability that the overloads are built inside, and it'll be on the name. It'll be on the name plate. So if you ever get a motor and you look on there and it says thermally protected, what does that mean? It means it's got internal overload. And some of them have reset buttons on the outside too. The little thermal overloads are dangerous because once they cool back off, the motor will kick back in. And just about every every motor in your house has those little internal thermal overloads. 
So if we're running dual voltage motors, we have these sensors that we have these overload sensors. Oops. I keep. So these guys, so a fuse. So this is a symbol of a fuse, right? Okay. And then this is a symbol of an overload heater. I mean, an overload sensor. It's got a C, and then it's got a C coming back like that. So what we would do is we would put the sensors right here. So the sensors are going to be in series with the actual current being drawn by the motor. So when uh, I'll do this about this. They're overload sensors. So when I look at our magnetic starter, so here's the output of the contactor. Then it connects directly to this. This is the overload sensor, and then the motor hooks down here. So all the current that's being pulled by the motor runs through the sensors, right? That makes sense. And these are what we call heater sensors. These are the ones. Uh, we have two types. We have the heater sensors, and then we have uh, the electronic sensor. So this has got an electronic sensor on it. This has, the other ones has what we call heaters uh, because they have just a small bit of resistance and anytime you put current through resistance, they generate heat, right? And of course that heat's going to do something. So newer contactors, new, new, newer motor starters will probably be solid, solid state. Old, older, uh, older installations will probably be heaters because they're a lot cheaper. And they're cheaper to maintain too. Talked about double brake contacts, right? Everybody understand what's the advantage of double brake contacts? They break, break in two, and they, they have a better tendency of breaking. Us. They they don't weld together here as much. Let's see, wiring diagram of a dual element heater. <laughs> An overload does not open while a motor is starting, but opens the circuit if the motor gets what? An overload. And the fuses do not what? So these are heater coils. I just showed you that on the actual uh, motor starter, magnetic motor starter that we're going to be using. So what happens, all, all the current that goes to the motor flows through the heaters. So this will be the line side. So this will go up to uh, one of your T outputs on your motor starter. And it goes through this coil and comes back and comes out here and this is where the motor's going to be at. So the motor is actually going to be connected down here. So all the current that goes through the motor goes through the motor, the heaters, right? Okay. Any questions? So these guys here work on a little assembly. It's a, a little ratchet assembly. Now, like I said, you were gonna run into this, and I'll pass this around. Let you see this. So this is actually one that was dropped and got broke. <laughs> so. The heater coils, I can get this up here, I don't have enough light, wrap around a tube, you can see this little tube right here, and this tube has solder in it. So when solder is cooled, it turns into a solid, right, you understand? And then we heat it up, Every all metals have what we call a melting temperature. And when you get the metal up to its melting temperature, it turns into a liquid, right, you understand? And what we have down here is we have a little ratchet assembly, and we've got a we've got a, a finger over here that's pushing against that ratchet, trying to slip. And when it slips, what it's going to do is it's going to kick the overload contact. 
So what it does is the, the, the current through the motor runs through the heating coil. The heating coil, if they get too hot, it melts the solder. The, the solder turns into a liquid and lets that wheel at the bottom do a spin, and then that kick, what, that's what kicks the overload. So this is actually the overload uh, sense and assembly uh, <laughs> that came off of one of these motor solders. Somebody dropped it and broke it. <laughs> now the, the, the lead, the, the tin, uh, the solder that we use is a tin lead, uh, a tin lead solder. And uh, lead has a melting temperature. It turns into a liquid of around 621 degrees. Uh, pure tin melts around 450 degrees. So solder is an alloy. And what happens when they when they form steel? They don't when they form steel. Normally, what they do is they get the steel in this state right here. So once they get that in that state right there, then they can roll it into any shape they want it to because it's just like clay, and it's not a liquid, right? You understand that? Uh, then eventually, once you get steel up to, I think it's like. 2700 degrees, it will turn into a liquid and it will flow like a liquid. Now, lead, this is called a plastic stage, and these are different ratios. There's 10 on the left and then uh, lead on the right. So we keep changing that, and you notice what happens the ratio you get to a point where this ratio here has no plastic stage. So I mean, as soon as this salter gets up to 361 degrees, it turns into a liquid. As soon as it drops down below 361 degrees, it turns into a solid. Now, this is called a eutectic solid. It's actually 6337. 6337 is eutectic solid. If I get those two ratios between tin and lead, it has no plastic state. So I mean these heaters over here, then once they get that once they get that little rod up to 361 degrees, it does what? It turns into a liquid and it allows it to do what? Spin and kicks over. <laughs> but the problem with these is the temperature might get up in the heater. <coughs> you understand that? Well, what do we have to do now before it turns it before we can reset this thing? Yeah, you got to let it cool down. So these heater overloads, the only disadvantage of them is you got to let them cool down before you can reset them. So normally what they do is they have a hat and they have some type of reset on the side. Uh, they're required now to have or that indicates when it's when the when the uh, when the overload is tripped. So that's what this thing is right here. So when this overload trips, this right here would turn red. Because you can't tell from the unit if it's tripped. Does that make sense? So if this is ever red, then what we have is we have a reset button. And we have this one's been bent too. We have one reset button that resets all the all the wheels. That makes sense? Everybody okay? So these are the ones that we've got. The problem is if I if I put a different motor on this thing that's wired for a different voltage, then I'm gonna have to change the heaters out, right? You understand? Uh, the heaters are not hard to replace. Uh, we just break this screw out here, this screw right here. We pull the thing out, find the right heater, and put it back in there. And you have to put the same heater in all three phases on a three phase. Uh, on a high voltage two phase, it usually has two heaters. You need to put the same heater in both lines, right? You understand? All that makes sense. Oh, good. <laughs> So I'll be showing you all what works a little better than uh, the way the book shows. It works out basically the same. It's got the wheel, it's got the thing on here, it's sitting there trying to pop it, right? It's got the spring against the tension. As soon as the lot of solid melts, it lets this thing spin and lets the new lot, let the thing, uh, let the overload contacts. Now the overload contacts are going to be inside the control circuit. So normally what we'll do is we'll come over here and uh, we could do this uh,
different ways. This is the best way to do it. And we'll come over here and we might have one push button labeled. Well, right now we'll call it stop. And we'll have another normally open, normally here contact push button. We, we can just call start right now. And then we'll have our motor starter. Uh, let me just call this so I can see you send me the right up below the comp contact. Let's go with him. And then I can use a set of relay, I could use a set of their auxiliary contacts to seal this in, right? Everybody okay? And then what we would do is this is where the overload contact would be. So our power circuit might look like this. I'm not going to draw the disconnects and the fuses. So we'll just start off L1, L2, L3. Uh, then what we would do is we'd come to our contacts. These are your main contacts on your motor starter. So they're going to have the same name as these, but these are over in the power circuit, right? Understand? Uh, then I'll drop down here and I'll have my overload sensors. Be my motor. Okay. Everybody okay so far? And this right here would just be labeled OL for overload. <coughs> so these sensors are what's controlling this contact right here. So I come up here, I start this thing, right? I press the start button, seals in, the motor comes up and does what? Comes up and runs, right? And then if we get an overload, what's going to happen? These sensors are going to open this contact. And when this contact opens, it's going to drop out the circuit. And this is really, really standard motor control circuit. With a motor that has external overloads. But like I said, some of the overloads are in, on some motors, the overloads are internal. But any motor that's got that on the nameplate, it should say thermally protected. It just means the overloads are inside the motor. And if it don't have thermally protected, that means that motor might not be protected against overloads. And if that motor ever stalls, what could happen? It could burn itself up, right? Maybe take your house apart. Everybody okay there? So the only thing loud between L2 and the load is overload contact. These are only going to be the motor starters. So contactors won't have overload contact, and also control relays won't have overload contact. On the motor starter, relays will have overload contact. So this is our three ways. Of, we can either have single phase load loading. Which usually only has one line that's considered to be neutral or common, and then we'll only have one fuse in that circuit. This is the way it's housed in Uh Even now, on a two, on a on a high voltage circuit, two forty, it should do what? It should break both lines because both of them are technically hot. They're let it, uh, they're electrically hot and electrically electrically loaded, right? And of course, three phase. Uh, we're going to break all three lines. Everybody okay? Make sense? So this is why if you got a, a 240 circuit, if you ever looked at those breakers, they're a lot bigger. Why? Because they have to break both sides, right? And then your 110 breaker is going to be real small. A control relay is a relay whose contacts are used in within the control circuit and are not intended to run high power buttons. All these things are intended to do is run other relay coils, run to run small lights, not big lights, small lights, and maybe solenoids, and little and rear rear fractional horsepower motors. And so these are some of the control relay. Control relay we have is going to be one of these. We call it relay. I would get that name out of there. But 
we be able to actually look inside of it and see the contact. And normally, the wiring diagram for the contact is on the label on the outside. A lot of these are designed to plug into sockets. And so we have a bunch of standard sockets out there. There's a little notch on these guys, too, so they're key. You just can't cram them in there anywhere you want to. So normally, if you looked at this thing, we can't see it from there. Uh, it would be round, and then it'd have a notch sticking out the side. And then your socket would have that same notch. Some of y'all uh, found the socket for our uh, off-delay relay, uh, and it was just empty. Uh, you could see the, the, the notch inside the socket. Contactors are used to make and break electrical uh, electric power circuits, lights, meters, transformers, capacitors. Uh, the contactors uh, may have, they might have one or more auxiliary contacts in the control circuit, right? Talk about that. Is everybody okay there? Yes or no? That's very quiet. Y'all know all this already? <laughs> solenoid. We know it's solenoid. Solenoid, what's a solenoid? We say solenoid, I guess it's more correctly pronounced solenoid. So what's a solenoid? It's a uh, actuator. An actuator is a term we use for devices that convert a power source into motion. Uh, these are linear actuators. But they only generate a force in one direction, right? And then we take a solenoid and we connect contacts to the actuator, and then we use that to make and break the contact. Now, how do we break them if it only generates if it only generates a, a torque in one direction, a force in one direction? A force in the right direction. Yeah, but what, what's going to make it could, well, not not necessarily. We have two types of contacts. Uh, we have a contact uh, that would be sitting on the solenoid like this. Oops, let me draw that. So let's say the solenoid is pushing up on the bottom. And this is the contact controlled by the solenoid. So when this contact moves up, it hits these two points right there and creates, completes the circuit, right? They're touching? They're, They're not touching right now. So, they do touch, yeah. Then we got these guys right here. So this is where our electrical input would be. Right? So my solenoid generates a force in that direction, right? You understand? And then it completes the circuit. I, don't, I shouldn't have that drawn on the top there. So contacts like this, uh, we refer to these as normally open. Contacts like this, we we refer to as normally closed. Uh, they could be connected to exactly the same operator. So my solenoid down here. When it generates that force, it would come up here and open this contact and close that contact. So in motor controls, a normally open contact, that's the symbol we give a normally open contact. And then a normally closed contact, we use this symbol right here. Now, once the solenoid moves, if, if, so if we mount the relay up, and then it's got this armature, right, and it's got a pretty good guy down here, then we can use gravity to bring them down. Uh, or we're going to use a spring. And I think that's what I passed around to you, right? So this right here has a spring. And one of these over here, you can actually see the spring. <laughs> Normally, industrial relays, you can't see the solenoid coil because of the, the wire, the, the, uh, I think I showed you all magnetic wire. It's really, really thin insulation because we're trying to get a real good coupling between the, the conductors. 
So if anything scratches them or anything like that, it could literally create a, a short, right? So what they do on the solenoid uh, is they encapsulate in the industrial relays. The solenoid coil itself is actually encapsulated in plastic. So here's the solenoid coil. Wake up, Rosette. This is the solenoid coil right here. And a lot of times this is re replaceable. You can't repair the coil, but you could do what? You could replace it, right? Uh, here's the armature or the plunger. So when I put power here, it's going to cause this plunger to come up and do that. Now notice what it's doing. This set of contacts is going to do what? It's going to close. These set of contacts on the bot on the other side, they're going to open. So this has one set of contacts. So, okay. And then uh, this has these springs down here. So no matter how I mount this, it's going to do the solenoid. Once I bring the solenoid in, and then I renew power, then the springs are going to push the, the armature back out, right? Some relays don't have that, guys, and they depend on gravity. So uh, a relay that has gravity, uh, a gravity return, you got to make sure you mount that sucker like this, right? You understand? If you go in there and mount it like that, the first time it energizes, it's not going, it's not going to de-energize, right? So here's the solenoid right here. Here's the coil for the solenoid. Here's the solenoid, the whole thing right here. And then the armature goes up and does what? It literally makes and breaks contacts. And these are double break contacts, and you can actually see uh, the spring on them. So they have the ability to tilt, right? I see, you understand what I'm saying? So what happens if, you, if it comes up here and it wells together, and then it breaks. If one side don't break, then it's going to literally tilt. It's going to help them break it, right? You understand that? So, but double break contacts are the, the most predominant contacts that we use in industry. Even our push buttons are double, usually double break. Um, but we could break this screw off right here. And then we could come up here and take the springs off and this armature would pull out and then we could pull the coil, uh, we could take the screw off right here and we could pull the coil out. So this one's repairable. So if the coil ever gets burned up on this one, we could do one. Uh, yeah, the coil on this one is rated at 120 volts, 60 hertz. And this is the control relay. Like I showed you, that control relay, it's got like eight contacts on it, right? <laughs> so some of them can have a lot of contacts. <laughs> well, this is a wire diagram. By the way, this is called a two-wire control. So if we count the one between L1 and the load, then this right here would count as one, and that would count as two. So people, some people refer to this as a two-wire control. Everybody okay? So these would get two different wire numbers, right? You understand? Uh, what we're on, this is called a three wire control. So this guy right here, between L1 and the load, I'd have what? One wire. I'd have two wires. And then I'd have a three wires. Why aren't these considered to be wires? They're the same wire, right? Because electrically they are the same, right? Uh, so you'll hear a lot of people refer to these as three wire controls. So three wire controls that don't have a serial number, which allows them to uh, Are we okay? So this is uh what talks about these. This has got two. Uh, so this would be a contactor. Uh, this is running some type of heater, so a heater uh, would be a single voltage. So this guy here don't require overload, right? And then the C would be up there. So this would be our power circuit. And this right here would be our control circuit. But down here, your control circuit could be 26 volts. And your power circuit could be what? It could be like 440. Everybody understand that? And so what advantage does a low voltage have over a high voltage?
<laughs> Everybody okay? We'll step up, step down, transformer. We got a, uh, we got ours. It's still, it's a dual bus transformer. We can wire ours for uh, around two forty. Uh, uh, you, you get one hundred twenty volts out here, right? This is kind of like a. I think 26 volts is what they use in Harrison on the to run the thermostat and all your controls on your uh, on your HVAC HVAC system, and then your compressor and your motors are usually running over oh, 240 volts. Now this is the selector switch because I'll be on that that old pad. <laughs> Two position selector switch. Ours is a three position, but it's got a the one we have is a three position, but it's got a center off position. And this is for a temperature switch. I forgot which one y'all call that one. Yeah, hook switch. <laughs> so what we need to understand is what the what the coil control, what the what the contacts control, and what the solenoid requires. It would be two different things. So I could have an AC contactor, which means it's got an AC coil controlling a DC circuit, right? Or I could have a DC coil controlling a contactor controlling an AC circuit. That's very common. Are we okay? Uh, an electrical arc is created between the contacts as they open. A long arcing uh, may result in damage to the contact. I think uh, these arcs created by electrical around 1300 degrees, which is well above the temperature of steel. <laughs> but we want to extinguish those arcs extremely fast, right? You understand that? So, what do we do? We make and break the contacts real fast, right? And then we have other things that we're looking at. Uh, also, these things, uh, the contacts and sales are usually copper, but they're silver plated. And so you don't want to get a nice file out and file, file those things off, right? Uh, you might get a real, real fine grit uh, sandpaper and do this. Normally, what we clean them with is just a uh, uh, pink eraser we use a lot of times. Not the white ones, the white ones are too soft. So uh, AC is a little easier to, uh, to extinguish than DC. But if you have a problem with DC, is that DC is always there, right? You understand? But where AC drops to zero twice during the cycle. So this would be the start of the cycle. And of course, how much current flow do we have when our voltage is zero? Huh? Is there any voltage zero? How much current flow would I have when my boat is zero? Yeah, there's no current. So what happens is in AC, it drops down twice every cycle. So that means if it's uh, outbound power is 60 cycles per second, then that means that thing is going to zero every 8.33 milliseconds, and the current flow stops. If the ozone can dissipate within that time, so so AC is considered to be self-extinguishing if the voltage is not extremely high, right? DC, we have a big problem with DC because DC doesn't go to zero, right? You understand that? So we got to come up with some other method uh, to get rid of the arc in a high-powered DC circuit. So what we do is we we come up here and we isolate these things. So so these 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 relays uh, that I passed around that little control relay, those contacts are open up to the atmosphere. Our new relays, you won't see those things anymore. They seal those contacts up. Uh, they put them inside what we call arc chutes. They put them in their own little troughs. Uh, they isolate them and then they put some type of plate on top of them. Uh, so they isolate. The contacts from each other. Uh, arc chutes and arc traps are used to combine, divide, and extinguish arcs drawn to the contacts under the when we open the motor up. And if we're running a motor, odds are we're going to open those contacts under the load, right? Or even if I'm running a heater. You know? 
So what we'll do is uh, they, they channel these things. So they'll actually put channels for each set of contacts. <coughs> so that means the arc on these contacts cannot affect the arcs on the other contacts. Plus what happens is when these contacts open, if we open them fast, it has a tendency to do what? Inside this narrow groove is to pull a puff of wind through those contacts. You know, it's kind of like when you're in a swimming pool and you, you open your hands real fast and the water does what? Comes swirling into the center real fast. So most of your newer uh, contactors uh, are going to be, each contact is going to be within a channel. So that way, if you get an arc and create ozone on this one, it won't cause this one next to it to arc, right? Let me tell that. And then plus it helps extinguish the arc. And then we come up and we put a lead on top of this too. So you have to keep it to prevent you from getting your fingers in the other contact. And then the wire connections are going to be down inside grooves too. Uh, so it's going to be a less, uh, it's going to be a less of a chance when you measure these things for your meter to touch, uh, touch them together. So this is a more, uh, a newer one right here. But see the screws where the wires mount inside here? They're down inside. They're down inside a hole. So when I measure this with a meter, first of all, I'm going to have to come straight down them on a vertical, right? You understand? And I can't lean them. And so uh, measuring these will be a lot safer with a meter. And then, uh, but you can see all of these are down inside. All of these are down inside a hole. <laughs> And then, of course, when you strip your wire, you want to make sure you don't leave any exposed wire coming out from under these compression terminals. Uh, these are these are very popular now. Uh, the problem we have with with stranded wire is is stranded wire does what we want to call bird cage, which means when you when you put it under a screw, it's going to, it wants to spread out. And if one wire, if, if a couple of wires come out from under there, then that means you messed up. So what they do now is they can, they can find it. So, so when it bird cages, it has nowhere to go. Can y'all see what I'm talking about? So you, uh, this would be, this, this, this terminal right here would be good for a solid strand and for stranded wire. Can't go nowhere. Can't go nowhere. The, yeah, the strands, the strands, the strands can't go anywhere. They're going to always be up under this metal plate right here. So uh, when you unscrew it, uh, the little plate, comes up, you stick the wire in there, then you uh, tighten it back down. Uh, you don't want to leave. Well, the rule is, is no more than one wire diameter uh, coming out between the edge of the insulation and the actual terminal itself. So you don't want a bunch of wires, but you can actually see they they even have the troughs out, out past this, right? You know? So that means if something arcs over here, it's not when it creates ozone. It's not ozone. It's not going to be able to get in over here. So these are your newer uh, motor starters. Uh, the the contactors I that used to have these relay contacts were all exposed, right? Uh, so they've changed a lot since the uh, the uh, NAFTA 70 uh, 70 E came out. Now what we do with big high power DC coils is we blow them out with a magnetic field. So uh, this is one way we can figure out. For what, so anytime I put current through a conductor, it creates a magnetic field. When you do that with DC, the magnetic field builds up and stays in the same direction. So what we have is we have what they call the left-hand row, um, or the right-hand row for conductors. So what you can do is if you point your uh, your thumb in the direction of the electron flow, then your fingers are going to wrap around. In the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, then we can generate, figure out the force that's going to be generated. So it actually generates the force. Uh, so we have what we call uh, the right hand loop for motors. And this is, you put this finger in the direction of the current flow. Uh, this would be the direction of the magnetic flux. And then this would be the motion. We used to use this to determine which way the motor is going. But what we're saying is the magnetic field will generate a force moving in a certain direction. Everybody okay? Whether you understand or not, maybe this makes sense. So on d these big DC power relays, we have what we call blowout coil. And so the blowout coil has a coil, and anytime I put current through the coil, it generates a magnetic field. 
Everybody okay? That makes sense. And then we the, the load actually runs through uh, this coil right here. So the motor would run through this. Now it's going to drop a little bit of voltage, but it's not going to be enough voltage to affect the le the, the running of the motors, right? You understand that? And of course, what happens? Uh, the contacts are closed. They don't show you that. Uh, now what happens is I wish I I wish I had that set up. We got a, a setup over there where we uh, we have a coil of wire, and uh, we have a neon bulb. We have a neon bulb that uh, that works at uh, I think it's like 90 volts or 80 volts to cause it to glow. And we'll hook that thing up to a coil and we'll charge the coil up to 12 volts. And then when we disconnect it, the neon bulb comes on. So what that means is the, the amount of voltage that the, the coil releases depends on what, what determines the amount. So to create a, an electromotive force, which we call voltage in this class, a lot of books teach it as an EML. But magnetically, what do we need? We need a magnetic field. What else do we need? Conductor. What's the third thing we need? Okay. And what determines how much? Strength of field. I put that on the test. You'll do good on that one. How many times have you heard me? Two would be what? Number of conductor loops. Yeah. Number three would be the speed of the motion. I'm going to put this on next test and it's not going to be on the review. So what happens is the contacts close. We come up here and put a magnetic field in this. This is going to uh, concentrate up these plates. The magnetic field is going to shoot through the gap and it's going to basically blow the arc out, right? You understand that? Okay, so that's when it closes. So these guys help blow out the arc when it closes, which is not the big thing. What we have problems with is taking a circuit under load and doing what? Breaking it. So what happens when it breaks uh, this magnetic field comes collapsing back into this core right here, right? And what happens now? It, it depends on the what? The number of turns and the speed of the motion. Contacts open real fast. And what that does is this, this is going to reverse the magnetic field and cause the magnetic field to flow between these plates and that, that the actual magnetic field blows the arc out. So you'll see these on big DC. We don't have to, we don't have them on AC. What we do on AC is we put them inside we put them inside troughs, right? You'll understand. Uh, now on DC, big big DC contact, so we'll have to we'd have to blow them out this way. We had a we had a big DC crane that uh, one of the lifts I don't forgot what it was uh, kept running out and it kicked the overloads on it. And what was happening was <laughs> we got up there on the crane and one of these big old relays was just you know, they were arcing across. And what had happened is one of these one of these paddles that came loose just fell down. So what happened is we lost one side of the blowout, right? You understand? So it wasn't blowing that arc out. But what would happen is when they lifted <coughs> when they lifted the hoist, I think it was the hoist on the thing. When it lifted up, when they let it go, the thing was just keep going. And then they would hit the top and then the overloads would kick it out. Uh, because it was so 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 and then of course when the overload kicked it out it would it would uh, it would be okay until they dropped it down and the next time they lifted it, it would be the same thing. And, and what had happened is that this blowout, this thing, that panel that fits up there. This this is uh, actually a panel uh, that we used to have. This is a DC panel, high voltage DC panel. Uh, and you can actually see the blowout, the panel is coming up from the blowout coils. You can't see the blowout coils themselves. Uh, because uh, uh, they're in here, it's the coils themselves right there. 
we used to have this panel here. This is one of the U.S. Steel used to send their electricians out here to troubleshoot. And we would bug this panel, and these guys would have to figure out what was wrong with it. That was part of their test. And what happened to the panel, I don't know. But... So blowout coal. Uh, Y'all ain't take in there, break. Right? Skip over your break. So the only difference between a contactor and a motor starter is motor starters are going to have to have an extra assembly added to them called overloads, right? And the overloads are usually actually separate, but they what they'll do is they'll mount them on the same mounting panel. Uh, another thing that we need to look at is uh, the size of these contactors. So each contactor should have a should have a size rating on it. These are all NEMA, which is National Electrical Manufacturing Association. <coughs> uh, these are the sizes that they've established uh, for different motor starters. So we have a double zero motor starter. So then once you get to double zero, then you come up here and you say, okay, you know, what size motor would that handle? Well, then we well, size zero, we can, we can, we can AC and D, I mean, I'm sorry, A is single phase and three phase. So on a, uh, a size double zero, which is what we have, uh, this is the one that we're going to use. Uh, then that says, okay. Then it says it can run a three-phase motor. On, it can run in a one-and-a-half horsepower three-phase motor at 200 volts. It can run a hundred and a half, uh, one and a half volt, uh, one and a half horsepower three phase motor on 230. And on, I mean, on, yeah, and in 460, it could run a one, two, uh, 115, one third, and then 230 single phase one. We okay? That makes sense. Uh, this is real hard to see. This is an older, this is a real old motor starter. And this wouldn't need to be legal in a new installation, but if you're working at places like U.S. Steel, uh, I, for some reason companies don't like to replace things that's doing the job they're supposed to do. They spend a bunch of money to put new stuff in there to do the same thing the old stuff does. So if you get into a company that's been around for a long time, uh, like companies like U.M. Steel or CMC Steel, you're going to run into real modern stuff, but you're also going to run into real old stuff, right? You understand? In their in their old mills. So we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't see this much, but the actual size of this motor starter is hid under this screw. This is a size two motor starter, and because this is illegal now, what they did on this one uh, originally they thought uh, that they could protect the motor with just looking at two phases of three phase circuit. So now we look at all three phases. So now you have overloads in all three. Originally, they had overloads in two. And then what they did is they had a reset for, for these, these phases. And then they finally realized that, that the center phase can have a problem. And the, so if, it, if something happens to the center phase, it can, it can have a problem that the other, the other two overloads wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't detect it. So that's why you won't see you won't see this anymore. So this is a size two, three phase. So what does that mean? Well, that means this guy right here is size two, three phase. If I was running this thing at 460, it could run a 25 horsepower motor. Uh, if it looks like at a size nine, right? Uh, it could run a what? Yeah, at, at, at four at four sixty, you could run that at sixteen hundred volt, sixteen hundred horsepower motor. And they had some sure enough horsepower motors up there. Uh, DCs, we don't have a double zero, so we got a double zero. We're our our think our motor is Uh, three phase, and we're running ours on 208, so it's going to be, we could run up to one and a half horsepower.
our motor on that on that contact. We're running on a half horsepower. Uh, this is a size two, so this is going to be somewhere on the on the. Uh, this one's a little easier to see. Uh, so this is the contact of uh, the uh, the motor starter we're going to be using. <laughs> And so it says size what? Sub zero, yeah. So this guy here is not designed to run a big motor, but it's going to handle the motor that we're going to run. <coughs> I'm not going to pass this ring. I'll drop that thing on you so you can thing with her. This is Nemo. They've got one for IEC too. I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it. Uh, you know, uh, we we still rate our motors in horsepower, right? And just about the rest of the world rates them in what? Uh, kilowatts, yeah. Which is watts. So we would have to we would have to uh, transpose this over. And what would we do on these horsepower ratings? Multiply by what? Uh, it says contact ranges vary in dimension from several feet. But we have some uh, contact values we already come right right here. You can get over here. And it's a huge one. Uh, Magnet mode starter is overload protection. We're okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is. Uh, there's several different types. We have a magnetic overloads. We have uh, thermal strip overloads, which are very, very popular inside of think tank motors. And then the ones we're going to look at is the uh, heater overloads. Let's see, current transformers. Okay. So this would be a size one. What's so, a so like size one handle? So where y'all find that chart in the book? Are y'all going through the book with me? Yeah, yeah, you're going. We're going to have to look it up in these books. Like I said, he sprayed it up. This is in there somewhere. Yeah, the chapter's on slide. Chapter twelve. Chapter what? Twelve. Yeah. Like I said, on the new book, it's going to be this. This one chapter in the older book is going to be split between several chapters, and that's something. So what we're working in. Did you say Matt? 12? Uh, 12. I mean, chapter 12. And this is a really good book. And uh, and they, it, it, what's nice is the, the technology that, that it te teaches doesn't really change much. They've added more about, the, about green power and stuff like that, which we don't get in here. But what the guy did when he comes out with uh, the different versions, mostly what he does is he just splits chapters up and adds more chapters to the book. But well, no, it's the same. It's just the the chapters are smaller. <laughs> so, uh, so you'll find it. Y'all know where we're at. So y'all found uh, this. Yeah, uh, what's this page? What page is this on? Um, 254. So this guy right here is a size zero. I mean a size one. So what should it be? In fact, it's on the number. If you look at the chart, size size one, uh, it should be able to handle what? Two horsepower at 110 volts. Should have it should be able to handle three horsepower. On 220 volts, single phase, three horsepower on three phase, and why why can it handle three? Why can it handle more horsepower on three phase than it can on two phase? So ask that question again. Yeah, well, how can it handle more? It's 110 volts, and power is equal to V times I. So if power is equal to V V times I, why can it handle more horsepower than it does? On Three phase and it does two phase. <coughs> so notice here, on 110 volts, it can handle what? It can handle two horsepower, 
But if I run it on 110 volt three phase, it can handle three phase. Which is more power than the third phase. Yeah, but what, the power is divided out now. So if I've, if I've got 120, so uh, the formula for, uh, for power on three phase, power is equal to, to V of any phase times I of any phase times the square root of three because the power is divided between three wires, right? You understand? So one wire is only handling about thirty, about seventy percent of the power. Does that make sense? So that's why we can uh, since it, since this power is divided out between three wires, uh, we actually can get a little more power uh, out of three phase. Are we okay? Uh, these are Neymar sizes. This is uh, this was ran off of, uh, and I still. And what does NEMA stand for? National Electrical Manufacturing Association. NEMA is uh, very big into into setting up the mechanics that we understand. So they, they, they set up open standards. So every plug that you see on these walls in here, over here in the U.S. is a NEMA standard. So they do plugs, they do motor frames, they do horsepower, right, you understand that? So uh, they're just a national standardization, but they usually deal with mechanics. So when we look at uh, this motor, it's going to have a it's going to have a frame it's going to have a frame style number on it, and that's a NEMA frame. So that means every motor that's got that NEMA frame would would have exactly the same dimensions as that frame right there. So what that means is if I if I know the NEMA frame, then I don't have to buy the motor from the manufacturer of the motor, right? You understand? I can buy it with the same frame, the same voltages, the same horsepower. Right, you understand, and I might be able to get it from a different price, and that way uh, we can buy. We it's more flexible for us. So it's like an industry standard group. Yes, NEMA over in Europe, it's IEC, International Electrical Consortium, or something like that. But they do exactly the same thing that NEMA. A lot of things that NEMA adopted, those guys have adopted too, since NEMA has been around for a real, real long time. Uh, but the biggest difference you're going to find in in the uh, in the uh, IEC standards is they don't deal with horsepower; they deal with kilowatt. Power. And they use the metric system. So what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to look at trying to figure out how to figure out to calculate a, a load load. And we do. So every motor's got a nameplate on it that, that includes a lot of information. And one of the labs we're going to do. Is, uh, we're going to figure out what all that information that name place is trying to do. But there's three uh, things that we're going to look at uh, when we look to figure out overload. Is we need to know the number of phases that it has, right? You understand? We need to know what uh, the full load current of the motor, which is going to be amps. Full load current, uh, and this is the way the book teaches, they teach it as full load current. But if, when you look at the nameplate of the motor, you're not going to see anything called full load current. They're going to be, it's going to just be amps. And what that is, that's the amount of current the motor will draw when it's running at its rated voltage, at its rated speed, at its rated horsepower speed. <laughs> Then a lot of motors will have what we call a service factor. The smallest service factor you'll ever have is one, uh, but it could go up. I've seen a 1.25 service factor. But this is the percentage of the motor we can safe we can safely overload the motor. Are we okay? So those are the three things we're going to look at: is the number of phases. We're going to look up for the amps. And then we're going to look at the service factor, and these things right here are going to determine what size heater overload we're going to buy or get. Manufacturing instructions on the thermal overload need those selection instructions, which is that are placed on plastic uh, chargers. Uh, so it says if we have a service factor 1.1, 1.15, 1.25 service factor motors using 100% of the current. Is the 
got a service factor of one or less than the one they're going to use water. So this is out of the book, but we'll give you the exact procedures. So this is a typical overload chart. This would be a manufacturer's overload chart. And this manufacturer's, uh, they, the part numbers they use for their overloads are B. So they have B0.44 all the way through B50.0. And these are their numbers. These would be unique to the manufacturer. And then we have a table over here that tells us how many overloads do we need. Do we need one, which would be for low loads of single phase? Do we need two, which would be for high loads of single phase? Do we need three, which would be for three phase? Everybody okay? And then what we have inside each one of these is how much of the current range that this overload could reliably detect uh, to heat up enough to, to trip the overload. So the one that they have highlighted, which is the B2.40, a three-phase, it would handle the motor that had a full load current of between 1.44 and 1.62 amps. Make sense? Yes or no? No. Okay, so tell me why it doesn't make sense. So you don't know enough to ask the question? Where's the B2.40? That's their part number. That's their part number. So that's like a model number on a car, right? It's that, it belongs to that manufacturer, right? You understand, it belongs to that manufacturer. Uh, so these numbers over here, these are the manufacturer's part numbers. So this is what I would order over here. I'd order this, depending on which side overloads I need, right? Does that make sense now? Now what these charts are, these are the range of full load currents that that overload will heat up enough to trip the overload. So this B, the one they got highlighted, the B2.40, without, for, for single unit, uh, it will look for an overload between 1.35 to 1.51. For two, it would be exactly the same because it's a single phase. On three phase, it's gonna be a little less because the power of the current is split between three phases, right? You understand that? That makes sense. So each wire is only handling 70.07% 70, 70 of the current. Or 70% of the current. Of the full of the current. So these two guys, they're both of these are handling the same thing. It's just here I would I would have to replace two. Here I would have to do what? Uh, I would replace three. Okay, they're okay. Now this does not consider the thing that we call the service factor. Service factor means we can literally legally overload that motor. Not permanently, usually for short runs. The motor will, uh, if you run it at their full service factor all the time, then the motor's going to fail some. It'll run okay, but it just fails some. Just like in your car, you know, if you run the dang thing wide open, it's not, may not fail, but it's going to fail a lot. It's going to fail sooner, sooner than it would if you ran it at it. So these are the little procedure right here. So this is the chart. You'll find this chart in your book. You said if you don't have your book, you need to get by somebody that's got one. What page is this guy on? What's that? 361. So we'll never have a we'll never have a service factor of less than one. Everybody understand that? So I wouldn't give you a 15 horsepower motor that tells you you couldn't get that many horsepower out. Right? So the service factor is either going to be one or it's going to be something greater than one. And it's going to be a number, like 1.25. And what that is, that's just a multiplier. It's just 1.25. So if I had a motor that had 1.25 on it, then that means I could get whatever horsepower is rated at and multiply it by 1.25 and that would be the maximum horsepower I could get out of that. I could overload that motor safely, right? Usually not for a, not constantly, but safely without doing what? Without burning it up, right? 
or stolen. So this is what we'll do. We'll look up the amps on the, uh, the full load current or the amps on the, on the nameplate. We'll make sure we find the service factor and also the number of phases. I think all the ones that we have are service phases. I couldn't find the nameplate uh, that was not in, on a single phase mode that was not uh, thermally protected, internally thermally, uh, thermally protected. So what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and look for the full load current within the watt in the charge that falls between that range. Then what we'll do is we'll multiply the minimum, minimum overload. Wait, there's something else you're doing. Oh, I'm sorry. If the service factor is one, then we're gonna we're gonna automatically degrade this. So this guy here has got it set up. His over his his overloads are set up for 1.25 service service factor. So there that's the size he's got out there. So that means if it's got a one, then we're going to have to degrade it by, uh, we're not going to use 100%, we're going to degrade it by 90, to 90%. So we'll multiply it by 0.9, right? Does that make sense? No. Tell me what that makes sense. This, this is the, the so what happens is most, most, most motors have a service factor. Uh, unfortunately, our motor over there, if I looked up the service factor on our motor, y'all can go look at it. It says service factor. You look at the SF, it's going to say zero. I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to say one. Which means I cannot overload that motor. <clears throat> so it's a, one and a half, it's a one and a half horsepower motor, right? Now, the problem is that's the exception to the rule. Just about all your industrial motors have the ability to overload. So what they're saying is that when I set up my my chart for my for my heater, I'm going to assume that it's got a service factor of greater than one. So the heaters are already set up or sized to allow an overload, not not an overload heat, but over what it's supposed to be. So if they're sized to allow a service factor greater that greater than one. That means if I've got a sir if I've got a motor that has a service factor of one, I'm gonna have to degrade the amount of current it could actually pull. Okay, does that make sense? So what it says is it says if I've got a service factor of one, I'm gonna multiply by I'm I'm only gonna use ninety percent of the current. So I'm going to multiply it by point nine. So whatever that service factor is in that motor, you multiply by point nine. What's that? Whatever the service factor is greater than one. No, not the service factor, the full load current. The service factor, the service factor is just a, is just a number that we use to determine how much we can over, we can technically overload that motor without burning the motor up. So if it's got a service factor of one, it means that's one times the full load current. So we're not changing the voltage. Normally we don't consider the voltage, uh, but what, what it means is, is if I come up here and put, if I got a one horsepower motor, right, you understand, and I want 1.25 horsepower over it, it's going to pull 1.25, it's going to pull 25% more current. So 25, to, to calculate 25% more current, we multiply it times 1.25, right, you understand. And that would be, that would be, okay, so what we're trying to, what I'm trying to say is that normally motors have a, normally industrial motors have a service factor. Because they understand that situations are going to occur that you're going to do what? You're going to accidentally overload that motor. Okay. So when they size those heaters, they, they assume that the motor's going to have an overload of at least 1.15, I think is what it is. So that's the way the heaters are sized. So what that means is, is that if they're sized for, for that current in that chart times the service factor, right, you understand, then what that means is, is if I've got a service factor of one, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go to a lower size service factor. So we're gonna, we're only gonna use 90% of the full load current. If it's only if it's got a watt, a service factor of one. If it's got a, if it's got a service factor of more than one, then we just use the full load current. That makes sense now? <laughs> Find the overload in the chart. So right off the bat, service factor of one, I would multiply it by 0.9. If it don't have a service factor of one, if it's got something greater, then I just use the full load current, whatever's on the nameplate. 
Then I'm going to do what? Then I'm going to find that current. I'm going to find that current within a range inside that table over there. Everybody okay? Then what we're going to do is NEC understands things happen. So what they do is they allow a 25% a increase of what you actually calculate. So right off the bat, it says we're going to take that full load current and we're going to multiply it by what? 1.25. So what's happened is that heater is not only designed for a, a service factor of greater than one, it's also designed for 125% current. 25% more current. And that's what NEC allows. So that means if I've got a circuit, a 50 amp breaker, it's not going to trip at 50 amp breaker. It's going to trip probably 125% of 50 amps, right? Okay, just for now. Then what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to figure out how what is the percentage between between this 125%. So we're increasing it by 125%. Okay. Then we're going to say, okay, is that too much? Is that going to be too? Is, is increasing it by 125% going to be too much? So what we'll do is we'll, we'll take our answer and then we'll divide it into the what? Full low current. And if it comes up to be grade less than 100%, which means we don't get that, then we're going to do what? We're going to go to the next higher overload. If it comes up here and does is over is more than 25%, then we're going to go to the what? The next lower overload. You don't have to stop the dance. So this is the important part. Is that up there? No. <laughs> okay. Everybody ready? Yes? No? Because we're fixing to go to a actual nameplate on the motor and see if y'all can figure out which overloads we're going to use. And I want the model number. Are we ready? Yes, no? Okay. So this is a, uh, how many phases? Three. So I think we're going to have what? Three overloads. 10 horsepower, but I'm not, here's my full load current. 22 horsepower. 7 amps. Right. And it's got a service factor of 1.15. So that means we don't have to multiply this by 0.9. We just use the full load current. So it's 22.7 multiplied by the 1.15. No, it's already taken, that's already taken care of. It. Yeah, all we got to do is worry about if it's less than that, right? You understand? No, we don't have to do anything yet. But that's legally how we can do it. But the overloads are already taken in consideration that the, mo that the motor already has a service factor greater than one. So what I'm going to do, yeah, we'll do this together. I'm going to go back to the chart. Okay, and I'm looking for a motor that needs what? 22... 22.7 amps. So that would be down in here. So it means we've got to use at least a size one motor starter. Uh, 22 points, 20 what? Okay, so that would be this guy right here. Right, you understand. Everybody okay? Any problems with that? Yes or no? Pretty straightforward now. Okay, so that's going to be a B45.0. Now we're going to see if it meets that 125%. If it's over 125%, then we got to go down one, right? If it's less than 125%, we have to go up one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my full low current, which is what? 22 point what? Okay, so I'm going to take 22.7, 22.7. And I'm going to multiply that by 1.25. Huh? That's 125%, right? And what does that give me? What we're doing is we're doing this right here. We're taking this, right? We're going to divide it by 
the work fire in a way divided into the water. By the answer from the mud spread, by the motor school of the What did we come up and get here? 20 what? And then we're going to divide it by what? 22.7. <laughs> what we have? <coughs> 1.25. That's right on the edge. Uh, what we're doing is trying to figure out if this overload is going to be okay. So what we did is we took the full load current multiplied by 1.25. We gave it to 28.37. Okay. When you come back and divide it by the full load card, it came up to be 125, exactly 125 percent. So that means, is this guy okay? Do we need to go up one or we need to go down one? Oh, is this guy okay? If it's more than 125, we're going to do the next lower. If it's less than 100%, we're going to do what? The next higher, so this guy would be fine. So it's usually the three. So you use the first one, that's the fine. So what we're doing is we're just going back and double checking, right? To make sure. So what we're saying is that when I divide those two, I need to come up with something between what? 125 and 100. If it comes up to be between 1.11, because it's percentage, or 1.25, then that overload is fine. If it comes up, when I divide that out, if it comes up to be greater than 1.25, it means I need to do what? Yeah. If the answer is more than 1.25, then we're going to go down one, right? Because we're, we're, we're letting too much come through. If it's, if it's less than, we're going to, we need to go up one. Okay, what about this guy? What overlay will we use for this guy? Hopefully this is the range. Oh yeah, 50 for 4 amps. Uh, 10 horsepower, 380 volts, 3 phase. But this is still a 3 phase. Like I said, I had problems on the same phase. So what size overlay would I use? Which, what would be the model number I would use for this one? Yeah, so this is this is their model numbers over here. And while we're looking up what are we okay? Everybody okay? So I'm gonna take uh fifteen point four. I'm gonna multiply it by one point two five. Guys, I don't know where I got this. I don't know where this came from. I need to go back and check that. Let's see. Let's see if it comes up to this thing. What did we come up and get? 19.25. And, and then we're going to divide it by 15.4. It's going to give you 125 every time. Yeah. Now, I need to go back and recheck this and check it over here. Because what we're doing is we're multiplying it by, we're multiplying the number by 1.25, then we're dividing it by the number, and it's always, the answer is always going to be 1. So I need, uh, I need to go back and check uh, where that came from. I don't know where it got messed up at. So right now, let's just choose the overload between there, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back and check where that came from. So what about this guy right here? This is only three quarter horsepower though, so this is going to be a dual voltage motor. So this is a dual voltage motor. So we have the ability, this is pretty close to what our motor is. Our motor is only uh, a half horsepower, this is three quarter horsepower, so this is a little bit more what we got. Uh, but 
but it'll run down to 208. 208 is a standard three phase voltage project. And so they say we can run these things on 208 or we can run it on 240. But when we come over here and look at our current, uh, 5.4 volts, why does, why does it require more current? At 208 volts than it does on 230. So on, on 200, 208, it's going to require 5.4. On uh, 230, it's going to uh, provide 5. I thought Alan Wall said his voltage goes down currently. So why does the lower voltage require more current? Because of this. It's a three quarter horsepower motor, 746 watts per horsepower, right? You understand that. So the lower the voltage, the more current it's going to require to produce that horsepower. So what you got to do is get resistors out of your mind. If I've got a resistor out there and I lower the voltage to a resistor, then the current's going to go down. But we're not trying to deliver to a resistor. We're trying to deliver power to a load. This is a three quarter horsepower motor, guys. It's going to deliver three point three 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 quarter horsepower. If it, if you do it at a lower voltage, it's going to try to deliver three and a quarter horsepower, which just means it's going to pull more current, right? So that's why you can burn a motor up if you run it on a voltage that's too low. Because if you got a ten horsepower motor, by George, that motor is going to try to produce ten horsepower, seven hundred fifty seven hundred forty six watts per horsepower. If you put that sucker on a too low voltage, you could burn the motor up. Because it's going to try to produce what? 10 horsepower at a lower voltage. So that's why the, it, it requires more current to get three quarter horsepower out of what? Out of 208 volts than it does what? At 230 volts. So we're going to run ours at 208. That's what we have over there. Y'all measure around 209 or something like that, right? So let's say we're going to run this motor on our power supply. Then what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a 5.4 volt. Uh, this guy actually, we can actually run this guy with 110 volts. It's a dual voltage motor, but it requires what? 10 amps, right? <coughs> so three phase, three phase, 208, so 5.4, service factor of what? 1.5. 1.5. That's a good motor. I mean, that's a big, that's a big service factor. We could probably plug this one. So let's plug it. And we plug the motor. You know, know what's plugging? Y'all you know what jog? What's a jog motor? What does that mean? Running short motors. Yeah. What's plugging a motor? Everybody here's probably did it. Stacy got a ceiling fan. Plugging a motor is when you reverse a motor without letting it come to a complete stop. Oh, it's so when you spin it and you pull the chain and then automatically. And you hear that thing humming because it's pulling full low current, right? You don't understand what it's trying to do what. So we call that plug-in plug -in motors. Uh, to plug a motor, it's got to have a real high service factor. We'd never plug a motor that's got a, a one service factor on it. You could burn, you could mess it up, right? Because it's going to pull start current for a long time. So plugging a motor, the term plugging a motor means you, you do what? You reverse the direction of the motor without letting it come to a complete stop. Anybody got seven fans? Uh, uh, you ever plug it? Five times. You hear that thing do what? Don't it hum at you? Mm -hmm. well, those things got overloads in it too. It's a wonder they don't trip out all the time. So which one, what B number would we use here? This should be, this is in, is this in the range of everybody's total? 5.4 amps. On there, 7.70. I was that there. 5.4. 5 .4. We're running on 208 volts. So 5.4, right, would be here, right? Single phase, I'm sorry, 5.4, be here. Because it's three phase. It would be a B91. I always thought we're going to be at 1.5. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
I didn't know that. But y'all got the gist of it, right? Y'all don't understand how this is working. And the one, the 125 percent, something's not right about that. It's like you add the two together. I can't remember. I need to go to and find the figure. That procedure is not really in the textbook. And I think that's the last one that I have on there. Except this guy. We can't look this one out. Our chart don't even cover this one. Uh, this guy has a, uh, what's the horsepower on that? You want to see it? 100 horsepower. Pulls what? About 163 amps. <laughs> that's at four, that's at 460. Oh, well. And this is not a number. Is that? S F is one point one five. Third factor. Yeah, one point one five. Insulation class, and we'll look at the rest of these things. Efficiency. Sometimes it gives us how we can do it. We'll talk about this too. This is new on motors too. This power factor correction. So this is a newer, this is a newer name And like I said, we'll, we'll, but later on we'll get into the motors and the section on trying to understand how to read these name plates on the motor. Uh, the only problem we have is that uh, these things are usually never uh, paper. They might be an aluminum foil. A lot of times they're metal. A lot of times what will happen when they rebuild the motor, they'll take the motor and they'll take over the, uh, over the name plate. You gotta look up generic stuff on it. Okay, guys, you'll take another two. was 40 degrees centigrade, right? On these fans, you can do 104. Well, they're saying, okay, uh, we have to figure this out. He says, uh, higher than the controller ampere and it's been through. So I mean, okay, if I'm running my, my heater, I've got a heater inside that thing that's depending on a certain amount of heat to Break that thing loose. If I've already got 44 degrees centigrade, that means my motor rate is not going to be able to raise it as much before it breaks loose, right? Does that, does that make sense? Uh, so it says, uh, for every, uh, same as controller, it says, these are our multipliers. So, uh, controller class, ambient temperature. So what it's saying is, uh, let's say a full load current. So it says, this asterisk right here, it says a uh, constant 10 degrees higher. So that means I need to take my, my full load current and multiply it by 90%, right? Y'all understand that? If we're running it 10 degrees lower, which will be this guy right here, then I can actually get it, well, I can actually get 1.05. Does that make sense? Yes or no? You know, more. Yeah, because that solder melts at a certain temperature. Well, if it's already at a certain heat already, then that means it's going to melt. It's going to it, it would melt faster, right? Does that make sense? So if you run it the whole time. So as long as I'm running below 40 degrees centigrade, then we're okay. It really comes into play if we're running our motor above if, if the ambient temperature of our overload, not the motor. If the ambient temperature of our overload. If uh, they're over 40, 40 uh, the rating of the motor, that's why we're going to have to direct that thing, right? Does that make sense? What if we don't have a nameplate on our motor? Well, we need to have some way we can get a rule of thumb. We need to know the horsepower of the motor, which we probably do. We need to know the voltage. So there's all types of charts that would give you a rule of thumb uh, that would tell you about what these motors would run. Uh, this is the chart that's in your book. I don't know how far y'all go to this is the chart out of the book I have. So if you got the new book, uh, I think Joe, Joe Bear showed me it was broken up. But it says, okay, I got a one horsepower motor, right? And these would be the speed, of the, the second of speed of the motor. And then if it's running at 204 volts, then these would be the full load currents I would use to do my overload if I didn't have the watts. 
I didn't have a nameplate. If you got the nameplate, then that's what you use. If the nameplate is gone, right, then you have to have some some method to go up to. Now, what I like is I like the one. Uh, so this is in the book. This is the one that's available to you. This is the natural electrical code. And this is a little easier to run to figure out because it don't have all the frequency. I mean, all the different speeds. So this is a direct current motor. This is table, this is your table number, so you can just type this table number. This is free, this is out of the National Electrical Code book. So this is table 430.247. This, <laughs> this gives us typical, typical full load current of different motors, it running at different voltages, if I can't, if I don't have the watt, if I don't have the name, if the, if the name plate is gone off the motor. So a two horsepower uh, DC motor running at 240 volts, I should expect it to pull 1.85 amps or around there. That makes sense? You okay? So this is a little better than the one in the book. The one in the textbook is a little harder to figure out. This don't give you all the different speeds. So this is table of four what? 430.247. Uh, this is uh, single phase motors. This is table 430.248 out uh, of National Electrical Code. But you're not going to find hardly any single phase motors over 10 horsepower. So that's the highest they go. But if I had a 10, uh, 10 horsepower motor and I was running at 150 volts, that motor would pull 100 amps, right? So y'all you know y'all you know have any 10 horsepower motors in your house. Most of y'all are down in these ranges up here. Quarter, quarter horsepower. My brain for a half horsepower motor is probably running the compressor if you have to be happy. Now these are single phase, so this would be where I could go uh, if I didn't have the name, if the nameplate on the motor was missing. If I've got the nameplate of the motor, that's what you should use, right? But the nameplate of the motor is probably the first thing that goes uh, the first time they ever have it rebuilt. And then this is a three phase. This is table uh, four, uh, four, uh, four thirty dot two four uh, two dot two uh, five zero. And uh, this gives us uh, typical full load currents for uh, for different horsepower motors. And there's another chart that gives us full uh, that gives us typical uh, what they call lock rotor current, which would be the start the start current, uh, which I would use to size my circuit breakers, right? Not size my overload, I've used that to size my circuit or my or my fuses. So you can look those up. So these these uh, these are not in your textbook. I just looked up uh, these on the internet for you. But this is in the National Electrical Code book. So there's a lot of information like in the National Electrical Code book. A lot of a lot of tables. Are we okay? Uh, we talked about some motors, some single voltage motors have internal overloads. Some of them are resettable, these are really nice. And some of them are actually thermal switches that automatically reset, and those motors can get you into trouble, right? You don't know why, right? Because you got out there and you got a motor that's not running, and you have power on your system, you get your hands inside those blades, and all of a sudden it resets itself. So you got to be careful on the on most of your on most of your HVAC systems that you have in your house. Everyone, or or you're looking at the motor on your washer or dryer or something like that. Those guys have internal overloads. That means they could overload. So if something happens in your dryer and your your drum gets stuck and kicks your overload out, your motor starts running, right? You get in there and start unloading stuff or doing something on your dryer, and all of a sudden it takes off again. Luckily, it's got a Fail slate the same thing you do it. So that's, you know, you know, disable that. Uh, so a lot of them have the bimetallic, we call it bimetallic strip. What it is, it's two pieces of metal. And they, they have different, what we call coffee. All metals expand when you heat them and they contract when you cool them, right? You understand that? Well, different metals expand and contract at different rates. If we take two metals and, and strap them together, then what happens is one of them expands faster than the other, 
uh, and we, we actually bond them together, then what would happen is this strip would literally, when you heat it up, it would literally curl up. And uh, that's what a biometallic strip does. So what we do is we send the load current through the through the strip. It's got a little bit of resistance. It creates heat. If it gets too hot, what does it do? It pump pins up and, and opens the circuit up. Well, what happens when it cools down? It goes back down. This is what's used in your in your uh, in your uh, in your uh, circuit breakers, but your circuit breakers have a spring in there that don't allow it to automatically reset. Right? You understand? In fact, uh, if you have a circuit breaker that trips, what do you have to do? You have to turn it all the way off, turn it back on to reset that latching mechanism. So it actually latches. If it didn't have that, it would reset itself. And of course, we know that uh, they can strap all types of things on these contacts. Uh, they can attract additional contacts. We call them, uh, we call them uh, auxiliary contacts. They can actually strap, some of them actually have additional power contacts on them, right? Uh, they can do, we could add timers on there. We'll get in later on where we can actually put timers on some of these contacts. Uh, we, we have what we call off delay timers and on delay timers. We'll look at that. Uh, transit or surge suppression, and we might add those to help, help extinguish the arc on our contacts. And then we might even have fuse holders on the contacts, on the contacts themselves. And most of these contacts just allow you to add different elements. And all we've seen so far is uh, these guys are here, right? Uh, but I think, uh, the relay that we have has a has an additional power pole on it. <laughs> this is the basic difference between EEC, the uh, International Electrical Council, I think that's what it's called, and then NEMA. So NEMA is here. NEMA was was the first organization that actually started started standardizing most of the mechanics, electrical mechanics, frame sizes, how big is the frame? Where, where, where does the feed mounting feed at? You know, what size outlet? What these outlets up here? Uh, what, what, what do they do? Uh, you know, uh, I think I told y'all when, when the electricity first came out, uh, these plug, these plug in, uh, these plug in cords, there was no standard. So you got a house and something happened to a cord, you couldn't buy the cord, a new cord, because there wasn't one. That wasn't a standard. It's whoever electrician wired your house and what they pay them. So eventually, <coughs> what they did is eventually, usually they, they, they realized that it would be better for everybody if they, if somebody comes out and does what? Set standards. This is the way we're going to do it. And everybody does it the same way. So that's why you can go to Lowe's down there and you can buy a standard outlet. You could buy what we call a NEMA 5, which is a NEMA 5. Which is this two-bladed connector that, or, or the three-bladed connector you see? So it's got two two blades, and then it's got a what? Uh, then it's got a ground, uh, right? And one side is longer than the other. That's a NEMA. That's a NEMA connector. And uh, this is what we call a NEMA five. And then we have a NEMA five fifteen, which is a fifteen amp plug. And then we have a NEMA five twenty. Uh, uh, which is a 20 amp plug. What they did on the fi on the 20 is they put a little notch on the side right here. So that means a, a device that's set to run on 20 amps will have the little L shape, right? So that means you couldn't plug it into a, a plug that's rated for 15 amps, but you could take a you could take a plug that's rated at 20 amp, I mean at 15 amps, and plug it into a 20 amp receptor. These are standards. These are standards. You know, you can look at NEMA, NEMA standards. Uh, so every plug that we use in our house is a standardized plug. If it's not a standardized plug, that means I would have to buy that plug from the manufacturer. I couldn't go to Lowe's and buy one, right? So you go down and start looking uh, on Lowe's on their electrical aisle and look at all those different plugs, and every one of them is going to have a NEMA number. So oh, all your all your all your 240 plugs are standard. Uh, of course, they're 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 different. Unfortunately, they're, they're different 240 plugs. So you got to make sure when you go out and buy a cord. So when you go out and buy a dryer, there's not a cord on it. You got to buy the cord, huh? Well, 
because they don't know which NEMA standard, the electron, the, 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 the 240 NEMA standard that that electrician acquired your house to. So before you buy the plug, you got to know what plug is there. You know, and that frustrates a lot of the guys at Lowe's because you're trying to explain to them what it looks like and you never want. You don't even never looked at it. You wouldn't bought you a new dryer when you never looked at it. So you can see uh, e, uh, IEC since it came out of the NEMA, it's got more stricter stricter standards. So your NEMA ratings is smaller, uh, smaller pearl horsepower ratings in NEMA. NEMA is larger pearl horsepower rating than IEC. Uh, low, uh, low lower cost pearl horsepower, higher cost pearl horsepower. You can actually see the difference between the two. Uh, like I said, I tried to find the IEC uh, charts uh, for you. IEC, uh, we don't use on uh, motors. Motors are not, not rated in horsepower, they're rated in what? Kilowatts. So, but you can figure out the uh, equivalent horsepower by taking that and dividing it by. So if you got a motor that's rated in kilowatts and you wanted to be found another horsepower motor, right? You understand that was equivalent. It's got the same name and frame on it. You don't have to replace the motor. All you got to do is be able to go between kilowatts and you got to be able to go between horsepower and kilowatts and kilowatts and horsepower. So what's the number? 7.6. So going from kilowatts to horsepower, I, I divide my watts by 7.46. Some people say 7.46 because that way you can go directly from kilowatts without converting to watts. So you'll see different, uh, different ones. Or you can go, you can multiply your horsepower times 7.46 and your answer will be in kilowatts, right? Okay guys, that's it for this chapter. You got any questions? So I know on the test you're going to have to look up a, a chart and I'll give you these charts. So I got this somewhat wrong. So I can just use I can run this off for you, but I'll provide this on the test. Not this chart, it's on the chart. No. Yeah. This chart right here, I'll provide this chart for you on the test. And you won't have to do the 125 percent thing because that was a waste of time. Because I need to go back and figure out <laughs> figure out where I came up with that. <laughs> Because no matter what we do, the answer will always come up to me one more two times. Huh? Every time. Every time, yeah. <laughs> we just make the we just make the overload legal anyway. So are y'all okay on this one? Any questions on this? So probably it's gonna be the equivalent uh horsepower, I mean watts per horsepower. Seven hundred forty six, it's actually seventy four point five point seven, I think. So most of it is 746 watts per horsepower. So there's not going to be enough uh, difference uh, to make it. Anyway. So you're going to have to know the difference between uh, kilowatts because you'll run into these different motors out there, right? Depending on what company you go to work with. You know, whether it's rated in horsepower or whether it's rated in kilowatts. And I, I prefer kilowatts because it gives you a good indication of what your full load current is and then your horsepower. Okay, guys, let's go lab. So I turn on all the lights. <laughs>